McCully is quitting politics at the election and will finish up his eight and a half year stint as foreign minister tomorrow. Known as one of National's backroom strategists, the Dark Prince, as some have called him, has helped see a number of national leaders rise and fall. His disappointments, not getting a free trade agreement with Europe and the Gulf states, but he told me he'd had some big successes too, and forging an independent foreign policy was one. For us, of course, that uh, raised the question of uh, the anti-nuclear legislation, our relationship with the United States, uh, whether we wanted to be a part of the ANZUS alliance, and indeed whether it would be possible to restore the US relationship to something uh, good but different. Uh, and uh, I, I'd like to think that we have managed to uh, achieve all of that. We've had a couple of US ship visits, which has been uh, terrific after 30 years. We've got a level of trust and confidence in the relationship that I'm very proud of. Uh, and uh, we've got an independent foreign policy, which means that we are able to, uh, to give our own New Zealand view on matters of uh, world affairs. Because I would thought you would have said getting the seat on the UN Security Council would go down as your biggest achievement. Does that still rate up there? Well, of course it does. I mean, uh, the, um, uh, the diplomatic business is a wonderful thing. You've got this vast army of diplomats who are trained to put the best possible spin on every meeting or every engagement. And um, uh, uh, is there something that's very different about a Security Council race because the numbers go up on the board in New York on a particular day and the numbers don't lie. It's the, the most objective measurement of success. Uh, John Key said to me um, afterwards that it was like winning uh, the World Cup in diplomacy, getting three quarters of the countries in the world to vote for us. And uh, I, I'd certainly put that right up there. It's a, it was a great privilege to have the opportunity to lead the campaign and then to serve on the council. What was the hardest decision you made then? Was there something that kept you up at night <clears throat> and perhaps you still think about? Uh, no, I think that... Um, Not uh, one decision that kept you no. up at night? Oh, look, I, I've been kept up uh, a, a lot at night and when you live with a constant uh, state of jet lag, um, uh, that's, that's a, a normal way to live. But um, I, I can honestly say that I don't feel uncomfortable about any of the, the big decisions we've made uh, during my time in office and I look at all of the relationships uh, that we've got with other countries and you know with a couple of blemishes I think we're uh, we've actually left things in pretty good shape. What are the blemishes you're talking <coughs> about? Oh look uh, I wouldn't want to go into that because it just makes life harder for my successor and but there are there are obviously a couple of areas where uh, for reasons that I regard as, as valid uh, we might have annoyed people. Israel <coughs> for example? Oh well that's clearly one yes. How did you, uh, what I'm interested in is that conversation you had with Prime Minister Netanyahu. What was that like? First of all, being told you had that call on the phone, and then tell me what that was like. Oh, look, I've, I've never said anything uh, publicly much about the content of the call. I mean, there's been a, an Israeli media report that's been fed by um, the uh, Israeli side. All I'll say is, was that I was left in no doubt about the strength of the uh, Prime Minister's feelings. Um, but, um, I, look, on, the, on this thing, I think it's important to say that um, uh, what was at issue here was New Zealand's position on the two-state solution. Uh, I don't think any true friend of Israel wants to see the two-state solution disappear as an option because it takes you into a completely different debate that no one wants to have. Because is Israel okay. took issue with you sponsoring this resolution. Why did you um, choose to do that? Why not just support it? Yeah, so um, this was a very unusual set of circumstances that um, the resolution was actually tabled on behalf of the Arab group by Egypt on the 22nd of December. Um, so it was... Uh, well after the year had concluded in most foreign ministries, um, our own included, but the, <coughs> um, between the time they tabled it and the time that, um, uh, that was going to uh, be on the table for de debate, uh, the Egyptians uh, changed their minds about sponsoring it and that left the co-sponsors, of which I think there were four, uh, to determine whether to proceed or not. Now, um, the, the fact is that um, uh, the co-sponsorship was something that uh, I had specifically mandated uh, because the resolution ticked the boxes of our long-standing policy. Two-state solution, uh, uh, condemn the violence, condemn the incitement. And, Were you pressured uh, by the US to do that, though? 
No. Because otherwise people from the outside might say, why do that? Why annoy Israel in that way? Because there was a lot of fallout from that, that decision, wasn't there? Oh, look, I'm, I'm, I'm aware that some people have got exotic explanations as to what actually happened, but the truth is somewhat simpler. There was a resolution uh, put on the table. The word, our words, actually, we tried to get some constructive language that we thought was better, and uh, we simply failed to get acceptance uh, by any of the parties uh, for that and somebody else put something on the table and we judged it on its merits. Do you regret just, the damage that it caused though? Oh look, I always regret uh, relationships that are that are damaged in the foreign policy world, but uh, actually the content of the resolution is, is actually much uh, different from what some people have represented it to be. I, I think we all support a two-state solution that's been mainstream New Zealand thinking for a long time. We to condemn the violence and the incitement, and we have settlement activity that undermines the two-state solution. Uh, New Zealand's position is well established on those things. Because another blot on your copybook, if you like, was the Saudi sheep scandal. Even though the Auditor General said that she shared many New Zealanders' concerns about the arrangement, do you wish that things had been handed, handled differently in hindsight? Well, look, I wish I'd never had the problem to deal with. Um, I didn't create it. I inherited it We'd, uh, through a series of actions, and people can go and inspect the record uh, themselves. So you inherited uh, the deal? Is that what you mean? I'd inherit, no, I inherited uh, a completely poisoned relationship, not just uh, with one country, but with one region. Uh, we'd completed negotiations of a free trade agreement back in 2009, and uh, because of the damage that had been done, it was put on hold, more or less permanently. Uh, and we were uh, told we had to find a way of restoring the relationship uh, with Saudi Arabia in order to be able to uh, normalise the uh, trade and economic relationship and proceed with the free trade agreement. Was uh, that the only way to handle uh, it, though? Do you uh, think in hindsight you would have done it differently? No, I, I absolutely believe that um, I did uh, what was in New Zealand's best interest in the best way I could. I accept that there are people who've got a different view. Um, uh, all I'll say, and I said this at the time of the Auditor General's report, is that I'm quite happy to personally take the brickbats, but when the free trade agreement gets across the line and we get those runs on the board and they start handing out some, bou some bouquets, I have to remember my name at that stage. Do you accept the Auditor General's concerns, though? I've never disputed it. I want to ask you, sitting down with Jerry Brownlee and having a chat to him, <coughs> what's the one piece of advice you're going to give him? I, I've already had uh, a good discussion with Jerry Brownlee. He's as you probably know, a very old friend of mine, and I think he'd be a very good foreign minister. And I haven't presumed to give him any advice because um, he's a vastly experienced politician. Even and, something uh, practical, though? Oh, uh, look, I've said I'll answer any questions you've got, but um, he will do things differently. He will do things his way, and it's good to have that sort of change uh, in a government and uh, in a country like this. Uh, and I wish him uh, every success. You have a reputation among your colleagues, a nickname, if you like, of being the Black Prince. What do you think of that nickname? Um, uh, I, I think it um, uh, was uh, bestowed upon me by friends uh, and was meant in a, uh, in a generous way. Um, so uh, I, I accept it in the spirit in which it was done. It stuck, though, and gives you the reputation of being a wheeler and dealer and strategist in the National Party. Is that <coughs> accurate? Oh, look, it's fair to say that I've spent um, uh, over 20 years of my uh, political career involved at the challenging end of domestic politics. And, um, and you were uh, a wheeler and dealer, weren't you? You were a big deal, a big player. Oh, look, um, I, I know that uh, people who've got to fill newspapers or TV shows um, uh, need to... to, to um, paint an exotic picture of this, but it's never been as glamorous um, uh, from my perspective. Uh, all, I, all I can say is that um, I've been very lucky, actually, from uh, the time that Jim Bolger uh, invited me into the ministry in 1991. I've had a, a, a role-serving a range of leaders in a range of different ways. Um, everyone comes into politics uh, to make uh, a difference, to have an influence, and uh, I've been given over that period many opportunities to have an influence. I'm very grateful for that opportunity. You've gone through some scraps as well with the party. Were there any moments that you look back on and pinch me moments, or has that, did that go away a few years ago? Uh, look, uh, there, there are always, this is a really tough business, and to play at the sharp end uh, for as long as I have 
um, yep, there are going to be some bumps and scratches. And uh, at the end of the day, you have to remind yourself that um, it's not personal. I mean, is that know, hard though? Because <coughs> it is personal, isn't it? Of course, it's hard, but uh, that's what you sign up for. And um, at the end of the day, you're just a, a product, just a can of baked beans, if you like. And um, uh, you just got to actually uh, resist the temptation to, to take it all too personally. One of the people you did do a bit of wheeling and dealing with, some might say, is Shane Jones. You did a speech to the Institute of International Affairs um, in recent times and credited Shane Jones with his work in the Pacific. Was part of the attraction of Shane Jones luring him away from the Labour Party because he resonated with some voters? Oh, look, um, <coughs> it wouldn't be, um, I think, uh, accurate for me to say that it never crossed my mind. That, Had a little bit be. of the Black Prince... Yeah, yeah, but look, uh, Shane Jones and I have known each other well from long before he came into Parliament. Uh, he's a guy I've always um, had a lot of respect for. And uh, we travelled a bit together in the Pacific. And actually, uh, because cause, uh, I've taken a number of tours with members of Parliament along, and um, we share a, a passion to see the Pacific region uh, move ahead to deal with some of the challenges there. Um, and, uh, and one of the big ones, of course, is uh, to try and put the Pacific tuna fishery onto a sustainable basis and Shane's got some particular skills and experience in that space. Will you be raising a glass of champagne if he goes and joins New Zealand first after this? Will you um, see that as a win? Well I know people find this quite hard to believe that he and I have been very proper about this. Um, I've arranged uh, uh, in a couple of weeks time to catch up with him to hear what his plans are but we've both been far too professional to have uh, that sort of conversation while we have the professional relationship we have. OK, OK, I'll, I'll take your word on that one. Um, Winston Peters, how does he fit into the mix with this? What's your take on that? Could National work with him? Could he be Foreign Minister again? Oh, look, Winston Peters was my predecessor as Foreign Minister. Um, he's a guy I've known for a very long time. Uh, he's a very experienced parliamentarian, and I've always tried to show uh, him appropriate respect for that reason. Uh, but as, uh, the, uh, as far as the events later this year are concerned, uh, the Prime Minister... Uh, I think is, is the person to talk to about that, and uh, I wish him well. One of the questions I wanted to ask you before you go, as journalists, we stand outside the door when you have these important meetings and you do the handshake and then you walk inside and we never know what goes on inside there. Was there one moment where you walked into the room and you had strips torn off you or walked into the room and thought it was going to be difficult and it was... Does anything stand out for you? This is um, my curiosity asking, you think? No, no, I've, um, I can't um, point to one meeting, but I can, <clears throat> I can say that um, uh, one of the th things that people don't think about in, in this job, because it all looks pretty glamorous and a lot of business class air travel and so on, but, um, but one of the things to come to terms with is the fact that you turn up at some of the biggest meetings of your career jet-lagged out of your skull, with the, uh, the jet lag really kicking in just as you're start, just starting a meeting with Hillary Clinton or John Kerry or something like that, or just as you're about to speak uh, in the presidency of the Security Council. Um, the, glob, the job uh, looks glamorous, but actually uh, one of the harsh realities when you come from New Zealand is that you uh, are always dealing with that constant fog of jet lag. We are talking later in the program about Donald Trump and his 100 years, uh, 100 years, it feels like it, 100 days in office. What's your take on how he's been doing? Uh, look, I think from a foreign policy point of view, um, you've got to remember that this is an administration that is um, not yet formed. So uh, you've got people like uh, Rex Tillerson, the Secretary of State, you've got the Defence Secretary Mattis, um, hugely capable individuals, I think pretty well respected internationally. Um, but of course you look at the next layer down and it's just not there yet. So um, the people who run the relationship uh, on a day-to-day -day basis with New Zealand, as well as in our area, of course, Japan, China, um, Philippines, the, all of the ASEAN stuff, uh, the, the Assistant Secretary is not yet appointed. Um, the people who will do all of that work to make the Secretary of State effective um, are not yet in their jobs. So uh, this is taking an unusual amount of time to happen, but uh, I don't think anyone can form too many conclusions without those personnel being there.